And on that note, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's session. So our gold sponsor, Beatrice, our silver sponsors, Merck and Roche, and our bronze sponsors, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And on that note, I'd like to welcome our host, Kathy Amandalea, who is the chair of the board of the Canadian Breast Cancer Network and as someone who has personally experienced an early stage breast cancer diagnosis, I think Kathy really understands how critically important these advancements in care really are. Kathy, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Jen. And welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to welcome and introduce our guest uh, speaker, our expert guest speaker, Dr. Sandy Sadev. Dr. Sadev is a medical oncologist at the Ottawa Hospital Center a Cancer Center, focusing on the treatment of breast cancer. He was the lead of the clinical trials program at the William Osler Health Center and was also the chief of, pharm of the pharmacy and therapeutics committee. Dr. Sadev is also one of the Canadian Breast Cancer Network's medical advisors, and we are incredibly appreciative of all the time that he offers to the patient community. And I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Sadev. It's great to see you. And thank you again for being here. I'm sure you will offer a, an excellent presentation. And with that, we'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Just, just confirm that you can see my slides there, right? They're working. <laughs> we can. Yeah, we had a bit of we had a bit of a freeze, folks. We just had a power failure at my home office just now. So hopefully it'll be okay. If there's a problem, I'll reconnect by phone. So thank you for inviting me. I really am looking forward to the opportunity. Uh, this is a broad topic to cover. In fact, each subsection might take a couple of hours when we talk to our students and residents. So I hope to give you a flavor for our excitement and how rapidly things are improving in this field. And uh, it'll only be kind of a high level overview, uh, but I hope to give you some excitement and optimism when you read things over. So this is who I am. I was a community general oncologist for 25 years. Uh, I've become interested in advocacy over the years when I've seen uh, patients have difficulty accessing new treatments. And we've been quite successful with the help of CBCN and other patient groups uh, in this endeavor. So my objectives today are to inform you all about the background and scope of the problem uh, with early stage breast cancer, review current and new approaches, and discuss future trends in the area. So you should be able to see my, my arrow here, but on the left, you see how many new cases of, uh, of cancer women experience in Canada per year from 2021. And breast cancer was about a quarter of them, but there are more deaths from lung cancer, almost double compared to breast cancer. The incidence of breast cancer has been pretty stable for the last couple of decades, but the mortality rate, so how many patients have died of breast cancer is going down largely because of earlier detection but also more effective adjuvant treatments, adjuvant meaning extra treatments after surgery to help prevent incurable spread of the cancer. This to remind us what we're talking about with breast cancer because there are different types. In the breast, there are glands that make the uh, milk. They're called lobules or lobes. And the milk comes through these ducts towards the nipple. And the majority of breast cancers start from within these ducts and they're called invasive when they actually burst out of the ducts into the breast cancer, into the breast uh, tissue. That's the kind we worry about that sometimes has potential to spread. Some of them start in the lobules and they're called lobular cancer. And they're about 15% or so and the rest start in the ducts. And if they're only inside the pipes or the, or the lobules are called carcinomas in situ, they're almost considered a precancer thing that has to come out, but is not usually dangerous. There are rarer subtypes of breast cancer we won't really be getting into today. And this is just to show you, for just out of interest, how we approach the classification of breast cancer. So the main hormones that feed into breast cell activity are estrogen and progesterone. And we can stain these cells in the microscope to see if they light up with brown dye. And the brown dyes are specifically meant to light up the estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor in this case. Uh, those are the keyholes or doorways that hormones go in through to tell the cell to grow, when to make milk, when the uterus should have a cycle. And if they express those, they're called hormone receptor positive or estrogen sensitive breast cancers. There's also another kind of breast cancer called HER2. HER2 is a protein on the outside of the cells. You see the brown on the outside. And in 20% of breast cancers, there's too much of it. And those proteins act as gas pedals that make the cancers grow faster and behave more aggressively. But it's not quite so simple. On the right, you see this kind of a, a breakdown 
uh, of a genetic analysis of the types of breast cancer. Uh, I won't get into today, but they're called the intrinsic subtypes, and they're broken down by their genetics. Uh, we now know that they can be really divided into the best kind called luminal A, the HER2 type, and the basal type. And sometimes this kind of older fashioned microscopic test does not accurately depict their true genetic behavior. So this is kind of the breakdown. Uh, basically, most of the breast cancers are this estrogen driven type. Uh, some are more aggressive hormone driven ones called luminal B. And about an even split are the HER2 amplified kind that are have that fast behavior and the triple negative type that I'll get into. This just shows it in a simpler term. The majority of breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive or hormone dependent. Some of them are HER2 driven and they can be a bit of both. They can overlap or they can have features of both. And there's this 15% triple negative bucket. Triple negative is defined by the absence of estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor and HER2. So it's called triple negative. But in fact, it's really a kind of a kitchen sink of maybe some different types within that category. Uh, and it affects how we treat them. We can use anti-estrogens up here. We can use drugs to block HER2 here. And for triple negative, historically, we've only had chemotherapy. And in my journey today with you, I will basically show how we're making major advancements in all these three spheres to help improve the outcome. The advancements are not just in better, more complicated, more expensive new therapies, but sometimes even dialing back the therapies because we can better pick which patients don't need them. So what about the stages? Uh, these are all considered early breast cancer from stage one to three. The only late stage is called stage four. And stage four is the one we fear, where sometimes cancers can travel through the bloodstream and leave incurable deposits in other organs. In breast cancer, the most common places are lungs, liver, bones particularly, and sometimes the brain, unfortunately. And by the time they show there, they're not curable today. Uh, we have great treatments. Some people can do well for years. Um, and we basically will talk today about the earlier stages where we're trying to prevent stage four ever from happening. Um, the earlier the stage, the better the outcome. But many of you may remember Olivia Newton-John, who had a stage one uh, breast cancer back, I think, in the 80s when I was a student, uh, and about 25 years later was found to have evidence of spread in the bones, meaning the cells must have traveled before her operation, but slept for all those years and then woken up down the road. Uh, the prognosis and the stage are also subdivided by the tumor features, how big it is. And these are the categories. Uh, the lymph nodes in the armpit, <clears throat> are they involved or not? And if so, how many? And the presence of spread to the body. And we call that the TNM staging. Uh, remember, the lymph nodes are taken out not so much as a treatment, but also as a test to see if the cancer is more aggressive, if it went there, if it maybe likes to travel, and maybe has been there longer. So what is it? Why, why are the stages important? So for the earlier stages, the higher the stage, uh, the higher the risk of, of passing away of spread of the cancer. If it's stage one at five years, almost everyone is alive. As you go further down, you start to lose people. For stage four, some patients can live for many years, but the prognosis is poor. And these curves on the right will be kind of uh, the curves I'll be showing you a lot to illustrate uh, how the trends are for different subtypes. So for stage one, patients do very well. And uh, years later, everyone is still alive. Uh, for stage four, most patients will have passed away by then eventually of their disease, unfortunately. And the further the stage, the more people we lose over time uh, in that curve. Uh, on the left here, we see a long-term follow-up uh, of, of patients even after they finish five years of preventive anti-estrogens. We'll talk a bit about that. But even afterwards, sometimes it can recur in distant body parts, even years later. So if you have a, uh, an aggressive patient with, uh, you know, four, four or more lymph glands in the armpit with cancer in them, then even 20 years later, the risk of recurrence in the body can be as high as 50%. On the right here, we see that uh, although we often talk about this five-year cure point where after five years, I'm cancer-free and I'm fine, that isn't always true with the estrogen sensitive kind of breast cancer, which can be very slow. Uh, for the badder ones with lots of lymph nodes, the majority are in the first five years, but there's a significant number that keep recurring in the body even, you know, five, 10, 15 years later. So for the estrogen driven slower type, half of them occur in the first five years if they spread and half of them are after five years. 
So what are our goals in early breast cancer to prevent spread to other organs and to save lives? And we're getting very good at that. We save jumbo jet loads full of people's like lives equivalent by preventive therapies. The term adjuvant treatment really means insurance therapy after surgery to help prevent recurrence. For these patients we're seeing for adjuvant therapy, I often tell them I consider you cancer free as far as we can tell. I like to call them not cancer patients, but cancer survivors, where we're talking about prevention so they stay that way. But there is a significant risk of these sleeper cells that might come back later, and we use medications that can kill rogue cells before they can grow back. The term neoadjuvant means before. So treatments given before surgery in some patients to help shrink the cancer and even prevent recurrence afterwards. So what have the major advancements been? Well, early detection you know, with mammograms you know about, uh, that may account for about 5% of the dramatic drop in death rates uh, over the last 20 years or so. Um, radiation has improved. Now, instead of giving six weeks, we often only have to give three weeks of daily preventive radiation to prevent leftover coming back in the breast area or the armpit. Uh, some people only need five shots of radiation nowadays. But I'll be focusing today on the medication aspects. And we'll be talking about the approaches by what I call the buckets the estrogen driven bucket of patients, the HER2 driven bucket of patients, and the triple negative, because the treatments really depend on the biology and what we know from the laboratory makes those individual cancers tick and what drives them. So the approaches we've had for cancer over the years, of course, we have surgery, uh, which can be curative and test the lymph glands. We have radiation after to help prevent leftover in the area and allow us to get away with uh, lumpectomy and spare the breast. Uh, better cosmetic outcomes, better patient satisfaction. We have systemic therapy, a term used for drugs. And we have all kinds of drugs now. They're not all chemo. And the newest kit on the block is immunotherapy, uh, which I've used for years in melanoma and is now coming to the triple negative breast cancer space. And many of you may read about that. So the first thing we have to decide, after someone's had their cancer out and they're doing well, who needs treatment? Most patients will benefit from preventive therapy, but the amount of benefit depends on the risk. So if someone has only a 10% risk of it spreading, if we don't do anything, and I can improve it by a third, that may only be 3% altogether of patients' lives that are saved, and for some side effects and treatments that may not be worth it to individual patients. What type of treatment do we offer depends on the kind of cancer, what drives it, how risky was that cancerous patient to begin with? If it's very minor, maybe they don't need anything. And we only use treatments if the benefit has been proven by really large randomized trials, thousands of patients over 30 or 40 years, where half had one treatment, half had the other, and we proved that it actually works and can prevent recurrences. There's an interesting tool from England called the NHS Predict. The NHS is the British healthcare system. These are the screenshots from my phone app that we often use to tell patients better their prognosis. So we type in their age, for example, postmenopausal. Was it the estrogen driven, slower, better kind? It was not the HER2 kind. Uh, the grade, the look of the cells in the microscope was medium, not aggressive, not the best. The size was about an inch. Um, we put all those features in into this program and it goes to a large database from England about what the outcomes have been in people treated for that kind of cancer. And we can tell patients that 10 years later, your chance of being alive if you didn't have cancer was 87%. Because of the cancer, it's down to 70. So many patients might be passing away because of recurrence. If we get preventive hormone therapies, it's 75. If we get preventive chemo, it's 79. And we'll talk a bit about bone strengtheners that may help a little bit too. And that can really help inform patients about you know, is it worth it to have the extra therapy? What's the magnitude of benefit? The one caveat is this tells you what's the chance of being alive or not being alive. It doesn't mean you're cancer free. So like Olivia Newton-John, it's in her bones now. So she has cancer. She'll be perhaps suffering with it and on treatments forever because of it, but she's still considered alive by this program. And what I really care about is not just are patients alive or not, but are they cancer free? I often give the example of my diabetes. You know, uh, I was diagnosed over 20 years ago. I don't want to be alive. I want to not be blind. I don't want to be on dialysis. I don't want to lose a leg. I don't want to have a heart attack. So I want people really to be cancer free. And that's a bit different than this. 
So, um, so first we'll talk about the estrogen sensitive, the ER or PR hormone receptor positive bucket of patients. The most important treatment, which really started uh, in the 70s, are anti-estrogens. We will talk about the importance of menopause and newer therapies in this space. So we'll talk a bit about how the treatments work, uh, what treatments have we used, and also how long do patients need to take them for. This is an example of how anti-estrogens work. Uh, tamoxifen is the granddaddy, probably the first targeted drug in oncology. It's a pill you take every day for usually five years. Uh, and you can see on the left that you know, this is the cancer cell lining. Estrogen receptors in these orange comet-shaped doorways are what receive estrogen. And when it locks into that doorway, it activates a cascade of signals that go to the brain of the cell, the nucleus, turn the DNA, DNA on to grow and to spread. And tamoxifen is like a master key that gets into that keyhole and jams it and breaks the key so it blocks it. So the estrogen can't get in to feed that pathway and those cells wither and die. Very simply put, the newer class of drugs we've had since the mid 90s are called aromatase inhibitors. So what's aromatase? They only work after menopause. After menopause, women don't make estrogen really from their ovaries, but they always have a back door where their body has an enzyme called aromatase that changes a bit of their natural male hormone into a bit of estrogen. And these pills shut the back door. So they basically take away much of the estrogen. And the estrogen then can't get into the keyhole, can't feed the cell, and they work a little bit better than tamoxifen. So this is so in the long-term data now. If you look at patients after menopause, where uh, people got tamoxifen or they got the aromatase inhibitors, the chance of being cancer-free was better with the aromatase inhibitor. So the recurrence rate uh, was good with tamoxifen, but even better uh, from 23% down to 19% with the aromatase inhibitors for at least five years. However, we also know that if we do a mix and match with tamoxifen for a couple of years and the aromatase inhibitors for the rest of the time, the outcomes are actually the same. So we'd like the aromatase inhibitors to be part of the five-year journey or longer, but it doesn't have to be the whole time. And that mix and match strategy is often used in Ottawa because that way perhaps you get less side effects of each. Neither one builds up in the body for the whole time. Some of the side effects of one actually counterbalance those of the other. And it's a nice way to kind of combine the two and get the same long-term outcome. This is for after menopause. The side effects of these medications can be alarming, but these medicines usually are pretty well tolerated. So on the left, you see the side effect sheet in the product monograph in the books and handouts you get at the pharmacy. And I'd be frightened of them too. And I always tell patients, you know, people read these much more carefully when it's a cancer drug, but no one reads the side effects sheet of birth control pills, of Advil, which are often just as lengthy. And side effect sheets are often wrong because they have to list whatever happened to anyone who took that pill. And if a person takes a pill in their older age for five or 10 years, everything they get naturally over their life goes on that list. So the real side effects from studies where half took an empty pill and half took the real pill, we proved people who got it did better. You know, there, a lot of the side effects happen just as often on the empty pill, so they're by coincidence. So what we talk about with patients for tamoxifen, hot flashes by blocking estrogen. Uh, we advised uh, you can eat tofu, you can eat soy, but avoid soy extract, kind of a drug to help hot flashes. It has estrogen properties, as do many herbal therapies. There are prescriptions GPs can prescribe to help uh, reduce the hot flashes, sometimes vaginal discharge because the vagina thinks it's like estrogen or dryness. There's a small chance of blood clots in the leg, the lung, very rarely stroke. I've not seen a stroke in my 31 years, thankfully. Uh, and that risk is exactly the same for every woman on the birth control pill. If you take it for longer durations that we often don't give anymore, there's a very small risk of uterus cancer, usually early stage and curable, because the uterus also thinks it's estrogen and it can turn the cells on. The chance of it preventing your breast cancer from returning is much higher. So like a seatbelt, it can kill you in a fire or lake, but it's gonna save you a lot more. Benefits, it lowers the risk of heart disease, lowers cholesterol, and for older women, it actually can strengthen their bones. Uh, my family has taken a pill called Reloxifen, which is a cousin that's actually designed to strengthen people with osteoporosis. The aromatase inhibitors similarly have a long list in the pamphlets they give people. Many are coincidental. These are the main ones we talk about. Hot flashes, vaginal dryness because you're lowering the estrogen. 
a slightly increased risk of osteoporosis because with less estrogen, the bones can thin faster. So we emphasize the need to not smoke, avoid alcohol, uh, take vitamin D and calcium, get regular physical exercise and monitor your bone strength. The most common one are aches and pains. It doesn't cause arthritis, uh, it just makes arthritis or aging wear and tear feel achier. So some people feel like the Tin Man when they get out of bed, they feel like an old lady. When they get up, they're stiff and sore. And often when they walk around or with exercise, it limbers up and gets better. It's not terrible. People need to be reassured uh, usually that it's manageable. And simple medicines like ibuprofen, uh, Tylenol uh, can help. Uh, if it's difficult and getting in the way, I tell patients, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We stop it, it goes away in a few weeks, and we can try another medication. So the key is education and reassurance. For young women, they actually found too that you know, because their ovaries are functioning, they have more estrogen. And if they have a more aggressive cancer, we sometimes like to put them into permanent menopause to improve their chance of breast cancer returning. Either we can take the ovaries out, it's done through a telescope, just like having their tubes tied, or we can give medicines that actually turn the ovaries off. They're an injection given every three months, often by the family doctor. So those are things we sometimes think of in younger women, particularly under 40, who have more aggressive cancers to really improve their risk. Uh, these are older uh, trials now with long-term follow-up called SOFT and TEXT. Uh, on the left, they had women who got tamoxifen, or some of them got the aromatase inhibitors, um, which only works after menopause, and they got medications to put them in menopause. And if they were put into menopause and got the aromatase inhibitors, you can see there was about a 4% less chance of recurrence of breast cancer. Pretty small, but in a bad, high-risk patient, it could be more meaningful. Uh, on the right, if you do turn the ovaries off or take them out, uh, it seems to be the aromatase inhibitors work a bit better, 6% better than tamoxifen. So we have that discussion with patients when they're quite young, if their cancers are more aggressive. Uh, if patients are on tamoxifen, how long should we give it for? Well, five years is standard, but if patients have more aggressive cancers, we often give 10 nowadays. We found the recurrence rate with 10 was actually lower by about 4%, and the chance of dying of the cancer was also lower by about 3%. So for more aggressive cancers, we sometimes will go to 10 if they're going to be before menopause. If they go through menopause, we switch to the kind, the aromatase inhibitors we can give afterwards. They also had uh, patients who finished five years of tamoxifen. Now they're in menopause. And the, uh, a Canadian-led study looked at adding five more years of electrozole, an aromatase inhibitor, and there also was a lesser chance of recurrence. So if the cancer is more aggressive and needs more than five years, if they're in menopause, we often switch them then to an aromatase inhibitor. The chance of being alive or not being alive was about the same, but the chance of recurrence was less. Um, if patients have started with aromatase inhibitors from the get-go and they take it for the whole five years, we have studies uh, that taking it longer, like going to 10 years is better, but this Austrian trial showed that seven years or 10 were about the same. So for many patients now, if they need more than five, we'll go to seven total and not have to go to 10 because even the little bit of joint stiffness and problems can be miserable and seven seems to be the sweet spot. So that's kind of uh, you know a very big overview of how we approach hormonal therapy. Chemotherapy can also help these patients, even though they're better patients, if they have a higher risk of recurrence. Uh, and we're getting actually better at deciding who needs chemotherapy. We used to give chemotherapy to almost everybody. If the tumor was over a centimeter in their armpit, uh, now we know better. So we know now we can look at what's called genomics. This is not genes that you inherit, it's genes that are defective or different in the cancer cells. Uh, there's a test called Oncotype DX. There's other tests available. This is the most common one used in Canada, where we send a part of the tumor to California and a laboratory there runs an analysis of 21 key genes that tells us the behavior of the cancer. And if the cancer is a low or medium aggressiveness genetically, then if the patients have got chemo or didn't get chemo, you can see there are two lines here, dotted and red. And the results, the chance of the cancer returning in over more than five years was no different. So chemotherapy does not help and is not necessary if you have a good genetic score on your cancer. So we often use that test as a way to spare giving chemo that we ordinarily would have given somebody. Uh, this shows now, this is new in Canada, 
if your cancer was in the lymph glands, but only in one, two, or three lymph glands, and it was estrogen sensitive, we also know that sending that same test off can help us also. If you're after menopause, and even if it's in your lymph glands, where we used to give everyone preventive chemo, if the score comes back good, chemo doesn't seem to make a difference. So now we can spare a lot of women going through chemo that won't, won't really help. In the younger women under 50, premenopausal, chemo still seems to help. They may have pound for pound have a bit more aggressive disease. So usually if you're under 50 and it's in the lymph glands, we still get preventive chemotherapy. So, you know, overall, the anti-estrogen pills are the most important. Chemotherapy can add extra benefit if the cancer is more aggressive. And these are the recipes of chemo. They have all these acronyms and code names. Uh, but basically, we have a few standard protocols. Um, some of the protocols involve a mix and match, three of one followed by three of the other, or four followed by four. The first half come from a fungal-derived chemo called anthracyclines, and the last half come from products originally discovered in the bark or needles of a yew tree. Again, by giving a mix and match, whatever cells in the body might be hiding that survive one, you hit them with another one, like a one-two punch, and there's a better cure rate. So that kind of combination approach has become quite standard. But nowadays, because anthracyclines, the first half of those recipes, sometimes can very rarely cause leukemia later in life or heart problems, uh, we sometimes just give a recipe called TC, uh, uh, docetaxel and cyclophosphamide, for four or sometimes six rounds and avoid the anthracyclines. So we made advancements in minimizing short and long-term toxicities. What are the side effects? Well, hair loss, there is there's an older recipe from the 70s called CMF that often does not cause hair loss, but it otherwise is more miserable, and we don't give it much anymore. Almost nobody vomits anymore. That's very important to reassure people. Taste buds go flat. Some people gain weight because they eat more sweets and fats. They can be tired. They have to make accommodations for that. The most dangerous side effect is a temporary lowering of one kind of white blood cell that fights bacteria called neutrophils not the whole immune system. And this goes down and comes back up on its own. And when it's low, bacteria from within your own body, uh, from the bowel, from the skin, could enter your blood and cause life-threatening blood infections. The only clue is fever. So we train people, any high fever, come right away to hospital. Sometimes canker sores, diarrhea, aches in the bones. Uh, the taxanes from the yew tree can sometimes cause numbness and tingling, and sometimes that can take a long time to go away. Um, so those are the main things we talk about with patients. We only give chemotherapy if we know from the uh, data that the chance of saving life is better than the side effects. Uh, as far as the timing of chemo, if we give that combination approach with you know half from the fungally derived drug and half from the tree, uh, it's actually we get better results if we give the chemo every two weeks and not every three like we used to. This is the risk of recurrence goes down and the risk of dying goes down. And I think the idea is that if we give it every two, there's less chance for the cancer cells to grow back between the chemotherapies. To give it every two, we have to give the immune system a kick with a little needle you take after the chemotherapy the next day to boost the white cells to come back faster. And that's what we often do in practice. What about extra treatment? The hottest new thing is if patients have had their cancer and it's a bad one, estrogen driven, uh, then sometimes we can give extra therapy after. The treatment's called the bemocyclib. This was the landmark study that just came out in the last year called Monarch E. This is how they define bad. More than four lymph glands involved or one to three lymph glands, but the tumor itself was big, ugly, or fast, a high growth rate. If it was big, ugly, or fast, or in lots of lymph nodes, patients were randomized in the study, have to get standard anti-estrogens, and have to also get this pill called a bemocyclib. What a bemocyclib does, and others like that, it helps to turn down the clock timer in the cells that makes them divide. You might remember mitosis from high school, where one cell becomes two, becomes four, and that timer mechanism that tells the cell to divide can be slowed down by this pill. And when we add that pill, for a cost I'm estimating of about $200,000 uh, over time, there's a lesser chance, about 5% less, in these very high-risk patients of the disease coming back. So that is something we're, all, we're already using now, but it's not yet funded by government, and we have to do it for patients with private insurance. So that's, a, that's kind of a summary of the most common kind of breast cancer. I'll wrap up again to review that at the very end. The next bucket I'll talk about are the HER2 breast cancer patients. So what is HER2? 
HER2 is this protein on the outside of the cells. In 20% of patients, there's too many of them. And when there are too many of them, they activate signaling downstream that tells the cell to grow and spread. Trastuzumab, the brand name that first came out was Herceptin, now we use uh, other brands, is an antibody, an immune system protein designed by engineers to attach to that HER2 and turn it off, and also to uh, attract immune system cells to come and kill that cell and flag it. And it works with chemotherapy, biggest breakthrough in breast cancer in the last 25 years. So now if someone has the HER2 kind of breast cancer, we usually give chemotherapy as we discussed, all these acronyms, but we also give trastuzumab with it. Now we use biosimilars that are basically uh, other brands that make it um, less expensively, that work equally well. So the, that drug, trastuzumab, is very well tolerated. It's a protein. Sometimes it can cause chills, hives, or wheezing that we watch for. And very rarely it can cause usually a temporary weakening of the heart muscle because there is HER2 also in the heart muscle that can be targeted. So we check a heart ultrasound every three months. And this treatment goes on for one year, usually for uh, every three weeks. It's not chemotherapy though, so it goes with the chemo and it continues. And when we do that, the recurrence rate goes down dramatically. So for patients receiving it, the recurrence rate 32 down to 22% and the death rate 21 down to 14%. So a major breakthrough uh, by using it in breast cancer. One recent advancement is now we know if the cancer really wasn't bad, it was small, less than three centimeters, no involvement in the lymph glands, then we can give a very mild, or mild chemo, one drug from the bark of the yew tree, once a week for 12 weeks, with the trastuzumab going on for a year, and the long-term disease-free survival is excellent. So like, you know, 97% of people remain well. So in patients with a good or breast cancer, we sometimes give this mild chemo recipe, even in elderly people uh, with the trastuzumab, and that combination is magic. They work synergistically and they can be effective without the side effects of more intense chemo. We also know that for many patients who don't have bad cases, if half the patients get six months or half get a year, in these studies looking at them, you know, uh, comparatively, if they get six months, they do almost as well. So the one here means that they're exactly tied. This little di diamond shows a summary of three trials that there was a bit of a lean towards the right. So maybe a tiny bit of a higher chance of recurrence with six months instead of a year, but they're almost the same. So nowadays we often give only six months to selected patients who don't have bad disease. Well, we also sometimes give treatment before surgery. We call that neoadjuvant. Why do we do that? Well, in the old days we did it to shrink the cancer so we could maybe avoid a mastectomy and get away with keeping the breast. Uh, if the operating room is delayed, we could start working on this fast kind of cancer right away. Uh, nowadays, we also know that the result of giving the treatments with chemo and trastuzumab before, when we operate, the result of how much is left over is very prognostically helpful. It tells us the future risk. And now more importantly, it helps us tell what we can do better after. If there's leftover at the surgery, we can do a different treatment that even further improves the cure. So for most patients who have stage two, meaning two centimeters or bigger, or in the lymph gland, nowadays we almost always give the treatment beforehand. If we give chemo with trastuzumab in the red box bars here, compared with the old way, just giving uh, chemo alone, you can see we almost double the chance that at surgery, there'll be no cancer left that we can see. I call that the home run. Pertuzumab is another antibody that attaches to HER2. So here's HER2, this quiggle. Trastuzumab binds to the yellow part. Pertuzumab binds to a different part from the other side. And what they found is these two actually work better together. So um, if patients have um, a complete response and there's nothing left at surgery, their long-term outcomes are much better, a lot better. Uh, we call that again, that home run, the pathologic complete response. So we try to aim for that. We try to aim for nothing being left. And if we get the two together, we get a better result. Neosphere was a study just where basically uh, patients either got the trastuzumab chemo with the extra antibody, or they just got their trastuzumab in the chemo. And the results were better, a higher chance of a home run, nothing left with the combination. The problem is that drug is not funded in Canada by government outside of Quebec, or if you have private insurance. It's a complex discussion. Most doctors would like to give it. It doesn't usually cause side effects, except sometimes diarrhea. The chance of getting the home run is 15% higher. 
It may spare the need for further surgery, may achieve a long-term better prognosis, but it's not funded by the government, and we don't really know exactly why. It's an area of ongoing advocacy. So remember I mentioned before that the result, is there any leftover or not, is very helpful. If there's leftover after the chemo and the trastuzumab, it means there's a stubborn part of the disease, and there's a higher risk that it could wake up in the body again. So the Catherine trial basically looked at giving people the rest of the year of trastuzumab or changing it. And they changed it to this drug called trastuzumab imtansine. It sounds similar. We often call it TDM1 in clinic. And what it is is trastuzumab, but it has chemo riding piggyback, a potent chemo that is not safe to give intravenously. But if it's attached to the trastuzumab, it takes it to the cell like a cruise missile and delivers it directly. And if patients that had, had leftover disease at surgery, if we switched to that, their outcomes were also better, about 11% better chance of the cancer recurring. And that is now our standard of care across Canada. So the result at surgery is very informative. After all of that, if patients are, have the psychological wherewithal, for high-risk patients, we also can use a pill for an extra year after all that called neratinib. And my best way of explaining neratinib, it's a pill, it gets into the inside of the cell and log jams that, that kind of uh, doorway or lock mechanism from the inside. Uh, blocks the signal as being sent to the cell to grow. That's six pills a day for an additional one year. I imagine about an extra $100,000. It can cause difficult diarrhea, unfortunately. Uh, so it's one that's difficult to, uh, to accept for many patients. This was a study looking at patients that had it or didn't have it. If they had the estrogen sensitive kind where the drug works better, there might be a 5% further benefit. So in some patients with the HER2 kind, after they've finished everything, we discuss adding this extra pill. We can get it compassionately from the manufacturer sometimes. Now we usually think about it in patients that had lymph gland involvement, more aggressive, or they had leftover. So that's that HER2 bucket, major strides. I'll finish off with the triple negative. The triple negative member is the ones that don't have estrogen, progesterone, or HER2, and the main treatment for them has been chemotherapy. Triple negative patients have the worst outcome historically. Uh, this graph goes from 80% to 100, not zero, but it shows that if you have the estrogen kind, your outcome is very good. Very few people die of recurrence. If you have the HER2 kind, patients also do very well because we have such good treatments, but the triple negative kind, pound for pound, has a higher risk of recurrence, unfortunately. The only tool we used to have was chemotherapy for prevention. So in the past, we'd operate, get preventive chemo. Uh, the chemotherapy, same recipes we discussed. We also know that adding a, a kind of a chemo called platinum that we didn't use much before in breast cancer probably adds to effectiveness. It can cause more numbness and tingling and more nausea. The other big advantage is now for stage two patients bigger than two centimeters or in the armpit, we also now also give the treatment preoperatively for reasons we discussed. The new kit on the block here is immune therapy. So in the triple negative setting, we can shrink the cancer better preoperatively. They respond very well to chemotherapy. Uh, we have a, a better prognosis. If they get a home run, we know they're going to do much better. So it's helpful. And if they have leftover, there are drugs we can give additionally that can further improve the outcome. That's, again, why we do it this way. Uh, if we add this kind of class of drugs called carboplatin or platinum, the disease-free survival, the chance of being free of disease is better, and the chance of uh, being alive and well is probably better as well. Uh, mathematically, not quite there yet, but it seems to reduce the risk of recurrence. So many of us will add platinum, even though it adds more side effects, unfortunately. Uh, if patients with triple negative have their, their drugs, then their surgery, and they have leftover, it again implies aggressive disease. And this study was largely done in East Asia and Korea. But those patients got extra chemo with a pill called Cape Cytobine. It's been around for ages, used in colon cancer, stage four breast cancer. They got it for an additional approximately six months. And they actually had a 14% less chance of disease recurrence and maybe an eight, eight and a half less chance of dying of recurrence with this treatment. So that's also one of our standards now, if you have leftover giving additional chemotherapy. What about immune therapy? What is immune therapy? It's been uh, first developed in melanoma, then in lung cancer, but we estimate by 2030, almost half of cancers will also be using immune therapy. Uh, it's not chemo. So basically, this, this is examples I show medical students. 
there are two classes, an older class we don't use in breast cancer and a newer class that we do. And the idea is the blue cell on the left, think of this as the police dog and, and the orange is the cop bringing the dirty sock to the police dog to go and find the crook. So the cop is the antigen presenting cell. It's the one that finds nasty proteins that don't belong in the body. It takes them to the uh, immune cell to say, go find this cancer and kill it. So the cop brings the sock, the dog then knows what to look for. They communicate, but there's naturally breaks on the communication to prevent the immune system from being overactive. So the first drugs we used to use, this Y-shaped antibody would turn off the breaks, release the breaks, allow the immune system to go wild. The newer ones we have in breast cancer is called pembrolizumab. Instead, it helps the communication from the police dog and the tumor. So the tumor expresses this protein uh, called PDL1. Uh, the police dog and the tumor to see each other, uh, there are naturally breaks on that communication to, pre to prevent the immune system attacking our natural body cells uh, when it shouldn't. So pembrolizumab turns that break off and helps the immune system go after the tumor better. So in this study, uh, I'll, I'll guide you through it. Patients either had the standard combination chemo with platin uh, that we give, four of one recipe, four of the other, and they had surgery, or they also got this immune therapy every three weeks. After surgery, they had the rest of it to complete one year altogether. And uh, in terms of the risk of an event happening, any kind of recurrence, any death, any spread of the cancer, by including the immune therapy, the chance of an event happening went down. Uh, from a, uh, The chance of remaining free of an event was improved uh, up to 85%. Uh, if they had a complete home run and surgery, there was nothing left, they all did very well with or without the immune therapy. If they had any left over, then the additional immune therapy made a dramatic improvement in the outcome. Uh, by about 10% less chance of recurrence. So this now has become a mainstay. It's been proven now, it's being used now, it adds side effects. Uh, it is also will cost about $100,000 for the one year of therapy. Uh, it's not yet government funded, but it is being provided free of charge by the manufacturer. These drugs have side effects though. So in some of the studies, there were rare deaths from side effects. Um, what happens is sometimes it not only helps the immune system find the cancer, it, the immune system by mistake can become overactive and attack the healthy body parts. So a fairly common one is the thyroid. If it goes out of whack, we can give a supplement but that usually is lifelong, pretty easy to treat. It's a very common condition in regular people. Sometimes uh, chills, fever, hives, like an uh, infusion reaction. Sometimes rashes like psoriasis, which is an immune system disease. Sometimes it can turn off the cortisone making gland and people have to take cortisone supplements. Uh, it's rare, thankfully. Uh, rarely it can cause colitis, an immune system attack on the bowel, uh, or any body part can be attacked. And I've seen almost anything happen. But thankfully, those serious side effects are rare. The chance of being hospitalized for that's about 10%. And the chance of severe side effects, usually manageable. We give cortisone pills to damp it down, are manageable. But you can see it's different than chemotherapy, it requires education requires the patient to keep in close communication with our team and very careful monitoring. The last other new thing in this bucket are called PARP inhibitors. This is not chemo, it's not immune therapy. It works a different way. And it works for patients that have that Angelina Jolie gene. You might remember Angelina Jolie. Uh, I think she has an Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Uh, the gene is more common. It can happen in anyone, however. Uh, it's a gene you're born with from mom or dad. And if you have that gene, there's a higher chance for breast cancer. She took off both breasts preventatively. So if people have that gene, we found there's a unique mechanism that we can take advantage of. Uh, that gene regulates the mechanism that DNA uses to repair its damage. So if that gene is defective, the DNA cannot be repaired by the cell as well. But the cells have a backup mechanism called PARP. And PARP is able to one block at a time repair DNA damage. So if, the, if patients have this gene from mom or dad where they can't repair their DNA properly, and we give this pill called the PARP inhibitor, the one we use is called Olaparib, that turns off the safety backup repair mechanism, then the cell can't repair its own damage and it dies. And that's how we try to selectively kill cancer cells with this drug. In this study, we took high risk triple negative patients. Um, most uh, of the cancers with um, uh, this gene are triple negative. If they had high risk disease, 
um, they will get additional uh, pill, a laparib, twice a day for an additional one year. Again, about $100,000 of therapy. And if they got that, the risk of recurrence was also dramatically improved. So it went from um, 79% to 86% were free of disease. This is something we try to use now in everyone we can who has this gene. In triple negative patients, about 20% of patients have this gene, so we get everyone tested for it by a blood test, and we're trying to apply this. It's not yet government funded, but it's going through the red tape currently. Side effects, the side effects of patients who got the dummy pill, they're on the right. On the left, you can see there was a bit more nausea, stomach upset. The dark blue are more severe, the light blue are mild. Fatigue, and the big one is actually anemia. So about 9% of patients would have anemia that might even require a transfusion. So it's not to be taken lightly, but in these high-risk patients, it can save lives. So I'll kind of wrap up with a summary. We're better at predicting now who has a higher risk of recurrence and uh, maybe preventing the need for treatment in some. We're better at applying our preventive drugs uh, so patients don't vomit. We have better treatments to prevent side effects. We know now in triple negative and HER2 positive, it's better to give our drugs before surgery. Uh, if patients have leftover, there are extra treatments we can give for high-risk patients that can further improve the results. What's the downside? These are going to add significant costs, some side effects that we're actually pretty good at managing. And it's going to require patients really understand this issue pretty well. It's complicated. When I was in Toronto working all those years, we only had 30 minutes to see a new patient. And you can see that it'd be difficult to discuss all these things. So sometimes I like to break up the discussion over a couple of visits. A colleague I met uh, at a conference from Taiwan said they had 15 minutes per new patient and five for a follow-up. So you can imagine, I really want patients to be informed. I don't want patients to be told what to do. I want you guys to have, as a community, to have the information, the knowledge uh, through CBCN, through homework, through good websites that I actually write down for patients to read about, and through good conversation to understand the upsides and the downsides and what patients want for themselves. Um, the most important thing is, as a reminder for the hormone sensitive breast cancers are the anti-estrogens. The big problem we have with that is compliance. About 40% of patients don't take them properly and they may, may not believe in them. They might read a book by Suzanne Summers or Gwyneth Paltrow and say we don't need them. I've had patients die because of that. Uh, we also uh, have new extra therapies. I mentioned these pills uh, for, for more aggressive patients that can help prevent recurrence. For the HER2 positive kind, we've had trastuzumab since 2005. We now have an additional antibody that can help even better preoperatively in some patients. Uh, if they have leftover at surgery, we have this other drug called TDM1 that can even further improve the risk of relapse and a pill we can give to some patients also for an additional year. Those are all breakthroughs. For the triple negative chemotherapy now, we give more preoperatively. If they have leftover, we can give a pretty simple chemo pill for an additional few months to reduce the risk of a recurrence. We have immune therapies we give preoperatively. Uh, and now we have for people with this uh, Angelina Jolie gene, we have an additional pill we can give. And lastly, for women after menopause, you may have heard of patients getting bone drugs. Bone drugs were given years ago because they can prevent osteoporosis. That's more common in breast cancer patients. Chemo and hormone therapies can cause it. So patients will get an injection of a bone medicine. Uh, my family got this injection through their GPs. It's a 35-year-old medication. 15-minute injection twice a year for three years. And they found it almost guarantees the bones won't thin. But they also found that it could prevent the cancer coming back. And that's why we give it sometimes now. There's also a pill version, sometimes cause the stomach upset that may work as well. So overall, in the long-term outcome, the chance of getting metastatic recurrence, incurable spread was slightly better, maybe 2% or 3% depending on the study, not huge. So for a patient with a very good breast cancer, they don't need these treatments. And even the chance of death may be very slightly better by an additional 2%. So in patients who, you know, where it might help prevent bone thinning, it might help prevent the cancer, we often give this additional injection for three years, twice a year. Our checkups are about twice a year anyway, so it doesn't add a big burden. Uh, there was a, another bone drug called denosumab. The brand name is Prolia. The GPs use for osteoporosis. Uh, in this study, patients were either given nothing, a fake injection, or this injection twice, uh, twice a year. It reduced the risk of fractures in half. 
And so it did help uh, prevent bone problems. And also the chance of the disease recurring, the chance of it coming back in the bones. All these drugs may make the soil and the bone less fertile for the cancer to take root. And the chance of dying of spreading were all slightly reduced. Another study did not show that for this drug, so it's still not as confident a recommendation, but it's a quick pick in the skin. GPs can give it, so it's another new option, and this data just came out very, very recently. The other problem with that drug is the bone protection is temporary. If you stop it, the bones tend to go thin right away. It's also not government funded. So that was a lot of ground to cover. Um, I think I hope that helps give you an overview of the excitement we're seeing. It's getting very complicated, um, you know, even for our residents and students to learn this, these topics now is getting pretty intense. But I want to leave some time for discussion and questions and uh, I'll, so I'll stop it there. Well, uh, I, I must say it was an excellent presentation, Dr. Sadev. Uh, all this information is uh, really enlightening and, and it also helps us understand how things are moving. And uh, the clarity of your presentation is also very, very useful for all of us that don't understand the language completely. So I wanna thank you for that. Obviously we have questions and we have a very short amount of time. And I think Jen will explain that we will allow for questions and we can use those questions to further uh, do more series uh, in the future. So let's start with one question. I have a quick question in terms of, uh, you're discussing um, how uh, later on in life, uh, things can recur for certain subtypes of, uh, uh, you know, and features of, of, of tumor biology. Um, and say a woman goes 25 years and nothing has happened to her, but you now discovered all these things along the route that if this, we could do this to better the outcome. What would happen if somebody that has been out for 25 years, nothing has happened to them and say, is there anything that I could keep, that I could do that would keep me on this path? So, you know, after 20 years, it's pretty unlikely you're know, going to have a recurrence after that length of time. Uh, so the first five years is a lump of them. Uh, after five years, there's a trickle. And that trickle goes on for another maybe 10 or 15 years. But it's a lower rate per year. Uh, I think basically what, we all, what I tell all new patients uh, is also that you are empowered to do things for yourself that make a difference. Uh, we talk about alcohol. Alcohol is a bigger factor than smoking. Um, the more alcohol per week, the slightly higher the risk uh, of recurrence and another new breast cancer. So we talk about that. We talk about exercise. For reasons that we don't understand, regular exercise seems to really help prevent breast cancer and maybe even recurrence. That's something patients can do. Obviously not smoking uh, if you've had cancer before. Um, looking carefully at your genetic makeup to see, you know, is there a risk? In America and Germany, I think all new breast cancer patients get BRCA tested. Uh, in Canada, it's only if there's a family history or you're triple negative do we get bracket testing. You can pay now about 250 US to get it done through a spit tube you sent to the States if you choose to get that testing done. So those are the things you can do up front. Long term, though, I think it basically is just motherhood stuff, fruits and vegetables, less red meat, exercise and monitoring with your family doctor. But you should start to feel more and more comfortable every year that passes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, someone writes in, uh, does genomic testing work for a triple negative breast cancer or is chemo necessary regardless for treating all triple negative uh, breast cancers? Yeah, so the, the genomic testing is only for the estrogen positive type, like 60, 65% of patients are in that bucket. So it's only, it's only for them. Uh, because in those patients, the most important thing is the anti-estrogen pills. Uh, for triple negative, you know, most patients need some type of preventive chemotherapy or before or after surgery. And for HER2, most patients do as well, unless they have a very, very tiny one picked up accidentally. Okay. Is there a way to screen for a recurrence after bilateral mastectomy? So after bilateral mastectomy, mostly it's by feel. 1% of breast cells could still be stuck under the skin. So you haven't got all the breast out. But in 30 years, I've only had two patients where they had a brand new breast cancer after mastectomy. So you just feel you're looking for something new. Don't check every day. You miss things changing slowly that way. Maybe once a month, you're looking for a new grain of rice, a new tiny pea or pebble that wasn't there before. It's going to always feel funny from the scars. Get to know it. Don't analyze it in the beginning. 
But over time, if something changes, always show your family doctor. Um, yeah, so that, that basically is my recommendation. You don't need mammograms after mastectomy. Uh, it has a funny lump that can do an ultrasound to investigate it, but it doesn't help the screen. Some patients ask me, you know, do you need to do scans to see if the cancer is spreading? And they tried that in the 80s, doing scans twice a year didn't help. Uh, the scans, uh, the cancer would come back between the scans whenever it wanted to. The scans had lots of radiation that may not be healthy, and finding it early in the body, unfortunately, is still not curable. So we don't recommend doing scans unless there's a problem. Thank you. And for oncotype testing, to decide whether or not you're going to do that chemotherapy, okay, um, when a test comes in, often we hear that it's, it's in the gray zone and you're really not sure whether it would benefit or not. How do you decide, for the most part, what to do? Yeah, so we, we never decide just by the oncotype. Because even if the oncotype is in the high zone where it's risky, for a high zone oncotype, that tells you what the makeup of that particular drop of cells is we've analyzed. But that same gene score could come back that score for a tiny tumor or a giant tumor. And the giant one's going to have a much higher risk. So you also look at the how small was the tumor, were the lymph glands involved, what was the grade under the microscope, ugly or good looking. You look at them all together. So if you have a high risk oncotype, I have a patient facing this now, uh, and the tumor is really tiny, you know, chemo is not going to help. The chance of dying of chemotherapy might be one in 300, you know, of side effects. Uh, very rarely, thankfully, have not had that, but most of my colleagues have had the odd patient have serious side effects. So, you know, you don't want it unless it really is clearly going to help. Okay. And and in terms of chemotherapy, and you mentioned uh, early on in your presentation that uh, uh, the vomiting is almost not non-existent with chemotherapies today. Uh, is it because of uh, what you offer the patients before they receive the chemotherapy? Because I'm sure you're still using AC Taxol, for instance, yeah. for yeah. patients, right? And those yeah. are so, very hard drugs, especially if they're given yeah. at the same time. Yeah, we have much better preventive medications now. Ah. So with the proper, oh. proper guidelines, we have maybe a 5% risk of vomiting nowadays. Okay. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time, and I know that we have a whole bunch of questions that we would have loved to get to. It, but we'll figure I'll out. Just, I'll just make on. one. I'd make sure. one quick caution. I forgot to mention before. Uh, you know, every case is individual. So yeah. sometimes, you know, when my own family hears a lecture, they go back to the doctor. Why didn't you recommend that? Always talk to your own clinicians. Uh, you know, never go just by my lecture or by things you read. There usually are unique situations about every case that drive the decision making. Uh, all the oncologists in Canada know everything I've told you about. So uh, always look to your own clinicians for advice. Thank you. That's very good advice. Thank you, doc Dr. Sadev. So um, with that, it concludes our time for today's session. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Sadev, for being here with us today, as always. And thank you again to our, sponsor, our sponsors, Viatris, Roche, Merck, Pfizer, and AstraZeneca. Thank you, Jen, for uh, putting this together. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and uh, listening to this wonderful presentation. We look forward to connecting on another virtual sh session in the future. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. and. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Sadev. Thank you. Thank you.